So yeah, my name is John Krulovich. Um, I have a, uh, a long-standing interest in metals, but of course I, I started as a large scent nerd. I've been an EAC member now. Uh, next year will be 30 years. Um, and came to this like everybody else does with an interest in large scents that started with early dates until I realized I couldn't afford them and then went on to other things. Um, <clears throat> so I've always enjoyed the sort of intersection of large scents and pretty much everything else, large scents and literature, large scents and uh, uh, foreign coins, large scents and, in this case, metals. The United States Mint, of course, was founded uh, primarily to provide a circulating medium for the United States, uh, but from its very earliest days also created other things made by the same pressmen, executed by the same engravers, struck on the same presses, many times even in the same room, uh, as the large scents and, and other sorts of early coins that we all collect. So uh, if for some reason you're not interested in metals, you're doing it wrong, uh, because they offer many of the things that you enjoy about large scents or quarters or early gold or what have you, uh, but many times with an even more significant historical story, uh, and many times also with a lower price tag for the kind of nice quality that people appreciate. Uh, so we've got a lot of metals to talk about. There is absolutely no way that I could talk about all of the metals struck at the U.S. Mint between 1793 and 1857. Uh, so we're uh, going to truncate it a little bit today, but hopefully touch all of the sort of major food groups and hit the high points and, and tell a couple of fun stories. So to start, uh, I'm going to begin with the most large scent associated metal that I could think of, which is the 1836 uh, first steam coinage metal. Now, Len, who I see in the audience here, was actually the guy that figured out um, that the uh, very earliest first steam coinage medals that were struck on February 22nd, 1836, um, are neat and fascinating and rare and were not struck on the steam press. It broke that day. So these were actually struck um, on a screw press and the later types were indeed struck on a, on a steam press once they got it operational. Um, these very earliest ones, uh, as you can see, they were struck February 22nd before the die was modified to reflect the second striking date of March 23rd. Uh, they just put it right over top of the February 22nd. These earliest ones are actually struck on large scent planchets. Uh, so it's not unusual to see them, unlike most other metals that we'll see, um, which, of course, uh, remained in high grade. They weren't meant to circulate. These things being struck on large scent planchets are actually usually seen circulated. So if you find a very high grade example of a February 22nd uh, first steam coinage token, that's fairly unusual. But this sort of circulated grade uh, is fairly typical. What's not typical is to find them looking like this. Uh, this one is fully gilt, not gold, but it looks like it. Uh, and this process would have been done um, prior to striking. It would have been struck with this uh, covering of a, a, a thin layer of gold flake on it that would have uh, come together and produced this sort of uh, proof-like look. So uh, one neat thing about metals, I know we all like copper here. Some people all like uh, silver and gold a little bit too, but copper is sort of our uh, uh, primary starting point. In metals, uh, copper is oftentimes the least desirable form of that metal. And for U.S. Mint metals, it's oftentimes the last of them to have been struck. So in this presentation, you're going to see metals struck in gold. You're going to see metals struck in silver and copper, of course. You'll also see metals struck in tin. Um, and we'll talk about why tin is important in early American metals here in a minute. Another uh, very interesting, very closely associated to the large scent sort of metal uh, is this. This is the Ricketts Circus token that was first struck in 1795 as an admittance pass to a, a circus, to a uh, horse and clown show. Not, not clowns, but people like clowns. Um, made at the U.S. Mint, again, on large scent planchets. Um, these were restruck later on in the 19th century once people started actively collecting these things. Uh, and of course, metal collecting in America also has a lot to do with the history of the large scent. Metal collecting really bloomed in the late 1850s, uh, just as a lot of the people in this room and the other room started collecting when silver came out of coinage. With the removal of the large scent, coin collecting blossomed, and one thing that people really gravitated towards at that point was metals. So the U.S. Mint fired up the presses, grabbed the old dies, and restruck many of the metals that they had struck earlier on. Uh, Ricket Circus tokens are rare in any form, um, but they're most common as these mid-19th century restrikes that are struck with a finely bronzed surface on a nice big thick planchet. Uh, and this one is a, a somewhat earlier one, again, struck on a thin, large scent, 168 grain planchet. So now that we've done all of the really closely associated to large scent metals, I'm going to go back to the very beginning of the U.S. Mint, uh, to the first metal struck there. 
Now, the history of U.S. medals really starts with the Comitia Americana series, which is a series of medals that was authorized during the Revolutionary War and then primarily struck after the Revolutionary War, 1787 to 1789, in Paris uh, for distribution to the Revolutionary War heroes that were so honored by the Continental Congress. Now, uh, most of these medals were struck um, uh, from dies made by the finest French engravers of the era. Uh, Augustin Dupre was the primary French engraver hired personally by Thomas Jefferson. Uh, he was friends with Benjamin Franklin, of course, did the Libertas Americana medal. And he subcontracted out uh, to other uh, sculptors in Paris, uh, including Duvivier and Gateau. Um, but they forgot light horse Harry Lee. Uh, for his action um, at Paulus Hook in basically what's today Jersey City, New Jersey. So uh, the, the Henry Lee Medal was actually struck at the U.S. Mint. It's the only of the Revolutionary War Commission Americana series actually struck first and exclusively at the Philadelphia Mint. Now, we have no idea where Lee's original medal went, uh, and the first reverse die cracked very, very quickly after its production. Uh, these dies were, were sunk by Joseph Wright. Of course, Joseph Wright died in 1793 from the yellow fever. Uh, so the original, uh, the original dies for the Lee Medal uh, do not exist in the form that they were created uh, by Wright, unfortunately, except for this piece and one other similar piece, which is struck in lead. This is the original obverse die, uncracked. You can see it's not beautiful, but if you want an early die state, uh, a Lee medal that was actually struck at the Philadelphia Mint in 1793, you're very close to it, this is kind of your only option. And that's the reverse. Again, not much there, not very well struck up, uh, but this reverse die exists only in the form of this particular specimen and one other specimen. Typically, when you encounter a Lee medal, it looks like this. This is the original obverse. You can see it's now uh, cracked. This was struck sometime after 1874, which is when the new reverse was made. And you can see the surface is much different. It was struck with bronzing. It was struck on a high-powered press, nice square rim, very, very different aesthetic than the piece that was struck 80 years earlier. And the reverse here, you can see the font is much more modern. Um, so when you encounter one of these, these are still rare, still very collectible, um, still go for several thousand dollars each. Um, but they were all struck after 1874 with a total mintage on, under uh, 100 pieces. Now, I mentioned tin was very important when we talk about early American medals, and that's because the first medals actually struck at the Philadelphia Mint uh, for distribution as medals, not as Ricketts Circus admittance tokens, uh, were struck in tin. Uh, in 1801, the original dies for this medal, dies that had been made in Paris, this is the medal um, that was created for Horatio Gates for winning the Battle of Saratoga in 1777. Those dies made their way back from Paris and actually were deposited at the Philadelphia Mint in 1801. Now the Philadelphia Mint uh, restruck this medal in bronze until the late 19th century. I think the original obverse die survived until the late 1880s and then a copy die was made. But in 1801, through probably about 1810, they actually struck soft metal impressions, so impressions on pure tin uh, of this metal, and they look just like this. So this was the very first of the Paris-produced Commission Americana dies that was actually put into place at the Philadelphia Mint. So normally, coin people kind of turn their nose up at tin. It's a, a lesser non-noble metal. But in the case of these very early uh, strikings, the Philadelphia Mint, a tin metal is, is almost the best thing you can find because you know it's very early. They were not restruck in tin. While it's difficult to date a copper piece later on, except somewhere on the die state continuum, these tin pieces are very, very clearly from the beginning of the 19th century. And speaking of die states, you'll notice that the crack that develops here and here, over here on the, uh, on the rim, is in its very, very early state here. Later on, when they struck these four collectors after the age of the large scent, so late 1850s onward, uh, it's a much more refined look. You have this bronzed surface, this bronze patina, slightly reflective, square rims, and also notice the die state is, is much later. That crack has advanced quite a bit. Again, still beautiful, still highly collectible, still rare, just not from the era of the large scent. There we go. All right, so the, the first real series of medals that was struck at the U.S. Mint for widespread distribution was the medals associated with the War of 1812. So these medals were like the Commission Americana medals, uh, like the medals uh, that were commissioned during the Revolutionary War, commissioned for valor by victorious generals or other uh, officers 
during the War of 1812 and then struck after the War of 1812. So the War of 1812 ended in 1815. Um, these medals were mostly struck between 1818 and 1822. The last was actually struck um, for George Krogan uh, for Sandusky, and that wasn't struck until the late 1830s for the first striking. Um, the restrikes were produced at the U.S. Mint through the late, uh, through the late 19th century, and you can actually get modern strikes on what's called peanut bronze, they're kind of the color of peanut butter, uh, that were struck in the late 20th century up through the 1990s. So this is the gold medal um, that was struck for Andrew Jackson for winning the Battle of New Orleans, and this is the gold medal. They only struck one, they gave it to Andy Jackson, and this is it. Um, this one is in the collection of the ANS. It's been there for about 100 years, and it came out of a bullion deposit. Somebody pulled this out of a bag of gold. You can see it's sort of knocked up and boogered up, but this was Andrew Jackson's actual personal gold medal. So pretty neat item. And you can see down there at the bottom, Battle of New Orleans, January 8, 1815. This is accomplished by Moritz I. Um, by a resolution of Congress, uh, just a month after that battle, he was named uh, the recipient of a Congressional Gold Medal. So cool thing. Now, if you weren't as high ranking as Andrew Jackson, Major General Gaines here, uh, he did not get a gold medal. He actually received a silver medal. And then several of the uh, commissioned officers that served with Gaines also received silver medals. Uh, so this is another military medal. Uh, this was struck for the Battle of Erie, so another uh, Great Lakes region item. Uh, and this is a medal that, again, you can get a bronze one struck in the late 19th century, 1000 bucks more or less for a halfway decent one. A silver piece like this, though, is very expensive and very rare. But tin, we mentioned tin being very important because it was really only used in the early days of the mint. These War of 1812 medals, the original recipients, like Macomb here, uh, got a gold medal. However, uh, they were given a small number of tin medals to give out to family and friends and distribute uh, to their immediate circle. These tin medals were really not appreciated until fairly recently. People kind of wrote them off, white metal, no big deal, uh, until uh, a few folks did, did original research and figured out that those white metal ones were actually struck at the same time as the gold medal and distributed to the person who received the gold medal. Um, so a Macomb medal, which is a really, really beautiful medal with a really neat battle scene of the Battle of Plattsburgh, this white metal piece was probably actually owned by Macomb and given out um, to a man who served under him or to a member of his family or, or this sort of thing. So it's very, very rare uh, and not that costly because a lot of people still don't really understand what they're looking at with these white metal medals. Um, this is what they look like when they're bronze. Again, this is probably struck 1860s, 1870s, has that bronze patina. Great looking metal, just not from the age of the large cent. And this is Macomb's actual gold medal. Uh, and this actually turned up in an auction in Switzerland. Uh, Macomb married into a, a Swiss family. Um, they cleaned out the castle and found this in the basement. So, best estate sale ever. Now, the Mexican War medals, of course, were also struck uh, during the age of the large cent. Um, most of Zachary Taylor's original medals have survived, including all three of the Congressional Gold Medals awarded to him. Uh, this is the one he won for the uh, Battle of Monterey. Again, this is a medal that in bronze is relatively common and relatively inexpensive, but this was Zachary Taylor's own gold medal coined in 1847. Um, now, the coolest Zachary Taylor medal, I don't have the picture of the gold one, although it also survives, uh, is this one. It's enormous, it's 105 millimeters, um, very, very thick dies by C.C. Wright with probably the most extraordinary battle scene on any American medal. Um, for the Battle of Buena Vista, which actually took place in Texas, um, the gold medal weighs, if memory serves, 11 and a half ounces. Uh, I once had to take it through airport security and I ended up explaining what it was to every single security officer they could find. Come look at this thing! Um, extraordinary medal. Now, the Zachary Taylor gold medal is interesting because it's also the first medal ever struck at the Philadelphia Mint from California gold. So, neat, neat historical item. That sold in 2007 and brought 460,000 bucks. So, cool thing. One like this in copper, 1,000 to 1,500. So, a little cheaper. Uh, now, the very first naval medal, uh, the, the book on these, by the way, is the, the book by Robert Julian, R.W. Julian, uh, called The uh, Medals of the United States Mint, 1792 to, I think, 1892 is what he goes up to. Uh, and he categorizes them into big categories, MI for military, NA for naval, um, MT for mint and treasury medals commemorating different uh, personalities. This is uh, the second medal 
in the Naval series that was actually struck at the Philadelphia Mint. This is for Edward Preble. Um, these were struck in two forms in 1804. They weren't struck in tin, they were struck in gold. Preble got his gold one. That's actually at the Museum in Annapolis at the Naval Academy now. And they were also struck in silver, but instead of being struck in solid silver, they were struck in silver shells, so they're hollow. Uh, and probably the neatest of the silver shells metal that survives is the one that President Jefferson got directly from the U.S. Mint, and that remains at Monticello to this day. And has never been cleaned, so it's jet black. They thought it was copper for a long time, and I picked it up, and it almost flew out of my hand because it's hollow, so it doesn't weigh anything. Oh, this is silver. Uh, this is what they look like when they're in copper. Uh, these were mostly struck, again, in the mid-19th century, 1850s, 1860s, probably for this one. Um, and you can somewhat date these on the continuum because of the rim cuds around the reverse, which are always filed off at the mint. Um, if you see one with filing on the rim, it's not damaged. That is the way it left the mint. That's as produced. By the way, the dies for this is by, uh, are by John Reich. So he did a, a good job on metals as well as coins. Usually when we talk about the Naval Series uh, from the U.S. Mint, uh, the, Mexi or the uh, War of 1812 is what comes to mind. There's an extensive series of medals struck for the War of 1812. Um, gold primarily for the original recipients, although some original recipients received silver ones. Uh, this is a silver one given to someone who served just one line below uh, Charles Stewart to one of his officers. Um, you can see it's got a great big cut on it um, so that the rim of that die broke very, very soon. This would have been struck right around 1820, right after the war. And they've all got these really interesting naval scenes in the reverse. This is probably the most popular series of U.S. Mint Metal from the era we're talking about uh, because uh, USS Constitution, USS Constellation, all of these famous ships, and you get a lot of really neat battle scenes on them too. This is Jacob Jones, another silver one. A silver metal like this is a twenty dollars to $25,000 metal. Copper ones are much less dear, um, but you can see that the die work on these things is really extraordinary. All right, so this is the, uh, let's see, first metal struck in the United States. Um, these were originally struck in Philadelphia in 1756. They were struck on an anvil with a sledgehammer uh, by Joseph Richardson, the silversmith. Um, Joseph Richardson, the elder, the father of the man who was the U.S. Mint Asser in the 1790s, um, and, but from dyes by a guy named Edward Duffield. Now, these dyes, like the dyes for the gates at Saratoga Metal, found their way to the Philadelphia Mint within the Mint's first decade. Uh, and many of these were actually struck at the mint, in fact, most of them. The ones that were struck outside of the mint were struck on top of pillar dollars and still retain that very distinctive rim, uh, that distinctive edge device from the pillar dollar undertype. Um, when you see these ones on great big silver planchets, these are very early restrikes from those dies, probably struck in the 1810s or 20s. And you can see the designs are fairly crude. These are not engraved by an expert metalist. Um, but this marks the burning of an Indian village in western Pennsylvania during the French and Indian War in 1756. And that is the seal of the city of Philadelphia in colonial times. Now, when you're going to encounter these things, um, you're going to see them most often not in silver, which is very rare, but tin, like this, struck at the same time as those tin gates at Saratoga medals, 1805-1810. Oh, and before we get on to uh, copper ones, the Quaker Indian Peace Medal, struck originally in 1757, made by the same die sinker, um, struck the same way. Those dies came to the Philadelphia Mint at the same time. This is the first American Indian Peace Medal. And so this is a white metal striking that, again, would have been made at the Philadelphia Mint, 1805, 1810. And by that point, this, this metal was already an antique, already a collector's item, and already in demand. There weren't a lot of collectors in America in 1810, but there were some. Typically, when you see these, you see ones from after the era of the large cent, still struck from the original dies, struck when collecting had blossomed in America, so post-1855, 1860, uh, and the die states on this thing gets wild. These dies completely collapsed. Um, you get enormous die breaks, struck on hockey puck thick planches to actually get some um, detail out of the dies, and eventually the dies went kaplui and, and were no more, and this is very close to the kaplui state. There's the reverse, which remained in, in fairly decent condition uh, up and through about 1874 when those dies were finally replaced. Now, probably the most famous series of medals uh, struck at the U.S. Mint during the Larson era are the Indian Peace Medals. Um, the first Indian Peace Medal struck at the U.S. Mint was the Thomas Jefferson Indian Peace Medal, uh, coined before Lewis and Clark went west. So this is a medal uh, very much associated with westward expansion and the uh, uh, first uh, American journey to the Pacific. 
There were earlier Indian peace medals, um, Washington Oval Indian peace medals, the so-called Seasons medals. They just weren't produced at the U.S. Mint. So this is your first U.S. Mint Indian peace medal. This is a big guy. It's four inches, 105 millimeters, with that very, very familiar peace and friendship reverse. This type, with a portrait of the president on one side and the peace and friendship reverse, carried up all the way through the end of the 1840s, just changing the chief executive. Now, like the silver preble medals that were struck on silver shells, these Jefferson medals were also struck hollow in silver shells. So if you ever get a Thomas Jefferson Indian peace medal that's solid, it's fake or a restrike. And these things were restruck in copper for collectors. You don't see them very often, but you do see them occasionally. Now, there were design changes in the Indian peace medal series uh, starting in 1850 um, with the ever popular Millard Fillmore. Um, I can't tell you how many times people come to my table and say, gosh, do you have anything with Millard Fillmore on it? Just, they are lined up. That's not true, actually. Most, most people don't know who Millard Fillmore is. But he made an EDD in peace medal um, with this interesting depiction of a Anglo-American and a Native American standing there, um, quite literally burying the hatchet. You can see the, uh, the ax or hatchet there upside down at their feet explaining the meaning of the American flag. So sort of a, a, a neat imagery. Uh, James Buchanan, right up there on the Millard Fillmore list of unpopular presidents. Um, this is solid silver. And this reverse type tells a, a sort of uncomfortable story. You can see that around the rim, you've got a scalping going on, so a depiction of Native American violence, while at the center, you see a picture of Native American peace, where they had adopted Anglo ways. He's uh, plowing behind a horse. There's kids playing baseball in the background. So this is the mom and apple pie uh, preference of Anglo-Americans. We'd rather you behave like this. Here's a medal. Here's what you should emulate. Now, if you notice, the, uh, the Indian chief there who's plowing his field is wearing a war bonnet, which is sort of like mowing the lawn in your wedding dress. So they hadn't exactly figured out how to be sensitive to native uh, um, uh, clothing and, and traditional uh, um, uh, practices. So a little bit off. But yeah, you could spend all day explaining all the various meanings and metaphors uh, on this medal. This reverse was also used on the Abraham Lincoln Indian Peace Medals. Now, Jefferson also depicts, uh, is also appears on an inaugural medal. This is the medal that got um, John Reich his job at the U.S. Mint. Um, this was his first effort as a Philadelphia Mint engraver. Um, very elusive medal. It exists only in silver and tin or white metal. Good looking portrait of Jefferson. Um, and not only is it a Jefferson inaugural medal, but it's also a commemorative of the 25th anniversary of the Declaration of, of Independence. So you can say it's got uh, the Declaration of Independence on the bedrock of the Constitution to commemorate July 4th, 1776. So really, really cool metal. And that's what it looks like in tin or white metal. The inaugural medal series um, continues through the present day, of course. Um, in the 19th century, it was spotty. Not every president got an inaugural medal. Uh, this is James Madison's inaugural medal, also struck in white metal. Industry brings plenty and scary looking eagles with pitchforks and rakes. The John Quincy Adams Indian Peace Medal, another really, really good looking medal. This is silver. Science gives peace and America plenty, sort of pleading for technology and technological advances. And that's white metal. And then they start getting a little less interesting. Andrew Jackson's inaugural medal was about the size of a dime. Um, when the King of Siam set was discovered, it had two missing spots, two gaps where nothing was there. One of them was the gap where a Jackson inaugural medal would have uh, gone in and has since been filled. Um, but that commemorates his second term. And you see these in silver, and they're not expensive. They were restruck for a long time in silver, so these are gettable for a few hundred bucks in silver. And then John Tyler and James K. Polk, a little less interesting, but much rarer. And then you start to get into other medals that aren't for military victories, aren't for naval victories, aren't for inaugurations, aren't for Indians, that are for a wide variety of occasions, marking famous people, uh, marking agricultural societies, uh, marking local commemorations. Uh, so there's a, a, a vast array of medals struck at the US Mint, so vast that very few people actually try to collect them all. Most people pick A series, military, Indian peace medals, agricultural society medals, and just try to focus in on one. But I wanted to give you a little taste of some of the other ones, uh, especially those from, from earlier in the large cent era. This one, of course, uh, depicts Alexander Hamilton. 
This is the only Alexander Hamilton medal uh, that exists from this early era, from the 19th century. So uh, this is a rare medal. Uh, I wish I had 50 of these in stock because since that show hit Broadway, I could have sold them all overnight. Um, I've owned, I think, two of these. This is a, a pretty elusive medal. Probably struck in 1811, which is when the second U.S. Mint was founded. And this is a picture of the first U.S. Mint building um, there in Philadelphia, not too far from where the Mint is. Right next to Independence Hall. The 1795 date was just the founding of the first US, uh, uh, Bank of the U.S., not, not the date the medal was struck. This is one of those agricultural medals. This is uh, dies by Christian Gobrecht uh, for the New England Society for the Promotion of Manufactures and Mechanical Arts. And they would give these things out at an annual fair for, you know, best spinning jenny, best snowshoes, you know, all that sort of thing. So when these are fun, when they have a name on it, you can go and research uh, to whom they were awarded and, and for what but a very, very beautiful metal, often comes very attractively toned, typically seen in silver. Now, this is a, a metal that was struck in a series by a guy named Joseph Sansom. If you've ever been to Center City, Philadelphia, Sansom Street, where Jewelers Row is, where some of the coin shops are, where the 33 Double Eagles showed up, that's Sansom Street, named after this guy. So Sansom decided about 1807 that he was going to create a series of medals for collectors. There were collectors back then, despite what some people have told you. Um, and they would commemorate all of the important people and events of the American Revolution. He had these grand ideas for this medallic history of the American Revolution. He ended up striking four medals and then quit. Anyway, this is one of them, uh, struck in 1807 despite the 1776 date on the reverse. Very, very popular metal, very rare and expensive in silver, um, but gettable in copper. Uh, most of these would have been struck later in the 19th century as restrikes from the original dies. And when I talk about a restrike, that's what I mean. I mean something struck from the original dies, but later. Um, many times uh, you'll see things described as restrikes that are actually from copy dies. They're from copy dies, they're not really restrikes, they're copies. So when I use the term restrike, I'm talking exclusively about things struck from the original dies at a later juncture. That's what it looks like in bronze. Another one of Sansom series with Franklin and Washington there. And this commemorates the end of the war, the Treaty of Paris. This is a society medal struck at the U.S. Mint in 1808. The Washington Benevolent Society was sort of a pro-federalist outfit that had uh, chapters in most American cities at that point. Uh, these almost always come either hold or with their original hanger on them. Usually when they're, when they're in this condition, the hanger has fallen off and they've been hold for wearing. This would have been uh, worn with a blue ribbon through the lapel. Benevolence. Cool item. Usually see well worn. Um, these things were worn for decades before the benevolent societies kind of gave up and moved on. Uh, and this is a, a fun medal because it kind of goes back to, to the large set. Uh, this was struck in 1821, despite the fact that it's got a 1784 date on there. Uh, and this was an admittance token to the Peels Museum in Philadelphia, uh, the forerunner to the American Museum of P.T. Barnum, who actually bought all of Peels' goodies, including his Mastodon. Uh, and of course, many of Peels' kids ended up working uh, at the U.S. Mint. So Peel is a familiar name uh, throughout uh, 19th century U.S. Mint history. Um, but these admittance tokens were made um, at the U.S. Mint, dies by Christian Gobrecht, and you can see Philadelphia Museum, admit the bearer. Um, there are a couple of these uh, gilt, uh, a couple in silver, and they also come with a uh, alternate reverse um, that's actually got a number on it, which would have been sort of a VIP pass. So we've gone back to uh, things that were struck for a use rather than just for a collector comm commemoration. Now, if you're talking about U.S. Mint history, and you're talking about great names in U.S. Mint history, you can't get too far before you run into the name Eckfeldt. There was Eckfeldt uh, working when the U.S. Mint opened, uh, and there was Eckfeldt there at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, and this was the gold medal given to Adam Eckfeldt the day he retired. Wonderful medal, uh, dies by Moritz first, uh, does exist in silver and in bronze. The bronze ones were typically struck uh, later again, 1850s or 1860s. Uh, it's scarce in any form, and in this gold form, it is literally unique. There's only one of these. Great metal. And this was in the hands of the Eckfeld family until very, very recently. 
Uh, another fun metal, going back to the early 19th century, uh, Benjamin Rush is also uh, associated with the history of the Philadelphia Mints, um, but is best known as a metal, medical doctor who had some interesting ideas on yellow fever and how to stop it. Um, not always correct, but interesting nonetheless. Uh, and this medal was uh, struck sort of to mark his genius. And you can see there, uh, neat little design, um, which uh, uh, depicts the, the trip from Philadelphia out to his country estate and his motto, read, think, observe. The neatest thing about these Rush medals is not that it's Benjamin Rush, who's a really neat character. It's not that these medals are very, very rare, although I know there's one on the Boar's floor for sale. There's probably 10 or 12 of these things known. The best part about the Benjamin Rush medal, and we'll leave it here, the dyes still exist. This is in the Library Company of Philadelphia. That's the obverse, that's the reverse. These actually ended up in the hands of the Rush family. Uh, and were deposited at the Library Company of Philadelphia, um, I think late 19th century, if memory serves. So this is what a metal die looked like. Um, usually finely polished, um, not always on a perfect cylinder. The die bodies um, ranged in shape. There are a few other early metal dies uh, extant, but very, very, very few. Uh, and from the condition of this die, you can also tell that this did not strike many metals, which explains why the Benjamin Rush metals are so rare today. In closing, these metals, no matter what your interest, whether you're interested in the history of the mint as a coin producing factory, or you're interested in the characters that struck your coins, or you're interested in the history of the nation and the famous personages uh, who were, were active and famous during the era of the large cent, if you're into large cents, it's pretty easy to fall in love with these metals. And if you've moved beyond large cents, you're probably on these things already. Um, they've become much, much more popular in the last say 15 or 20 years. Um, there's a wide collecting base. There's a great club, which I'll encourage all of you to join, called the Metal Collectors of America. Um, they put out a, a great magazine called the MCA Advisory, which isn't quite up to penny-wise quality, but it's pretty close. It's a great magazine, and I, I highly recommend it and enjoy it every month. So if you all have any questions about any of these medals that you saw, any medals you didn't, or anything else related to, to medals, I'm, I'm happy to entertain them. <laughs>